Hi everyone, I'm Scott Schneider. This is Stereo Niche. This video is a bit of a follow-up from the last video, which was vintage versus modern, the build quality. And I received a lot of comments and I wanted to talk through some of those uh, because there were some good themes going on. So stick around. Okay, well, let's jump into it. So what I've done is I've taken not the complete comment, but I've summarized them to the points that I wanted to get to, and I've put them together into some themes uh, that I wanted to talk about and elaborate on a little bit. So you can find the entire quote in the comments if you want to you know, scroll through. But um, So let me start off with uh, Random Retro. Uh, he says, you make a good point about recapping. When I first got into radio and hi-fi, I recapped everything before even trying to turn it on. Now I use a Variac and only replace capacitors if they're bulging or leaking. I have many 30s era tube radios that work fine on original capacitors. Mike Campbell says, I have a 1936 Silvertone radio. It has all original parts except for the green tuning eye. It quit working for a year and suddenly started working again. I have a Marantz 2220B and a Sansui 5050 from the 70s, and they are all original too. Steve Zeidman, I love the audio gear that was produced 45 to 50 years ago. I have purchased several excellent condition vintage pieces from the 70s. I have had less success in terms of components viability. Many have had some kind of problem. Either they're static in a channel or a function becomes inoperable. Okay, so a couple of points I wanted to talk about here. One is the earlier uh, vintage gear made prior to, say, the 1950s. Uh, the very early tube gear, I don't have much in the way of experience with it. It's an era that I simply don't collect. Uh, but I do have, um, I guess, some experience in, in, in other people that have collected it and the similar comments that they have also not recapped a lot of that gear. Uh, I oil capacitors and things like that, I'm, uh, which I don't know much about that era as much, but from what I understand, a lot of people have done the same thing. The, uh, the gear from that era, they brought it up on a Variac and a lot of the capacitors and things have not been changed. So they're still running strong. The last point here is about the, uh, the era of the gear that I have been talking about. And this, uh, the point here is, uh, that, that Steve was making about uh, having issues with you know, some of the units. Absolutely. Uh, I was not trying to articulate in my earlier video that you can just take any of these units and not have a single issue. Not the case whatsoever. There are potentiometers in here. There are potential for a cap or a resistor or some small issue to happen. Absolutely. Uh, it is, uh, these are 50 to 60 plus years old. So yes, uh, there is at least the expectation in my mind that almost all of these pots need to be uh, cleaned and get that static out of there because of oxidation. So uh, if anyone thought that I was uh, uh, suggesting that these could have no problems, that wasn't the case at all. Uh, they do have small issues and, and I think you should mostly expect some annual maintenance uh, for the most part. If you uh, uh, don't expect that, then I, I think you're setting yourself up for disappointment. It's just like an old car. It does need some, a little bit of maintenance here and there. But the point I was making is that on a, on a mass level, mass component failures were not as common. That's the point I was trying to make. So thank you for the comments. And uh, let's see what we have next. Uh, Sides Up uh, had an interesting comment. He says, one of his Luxman tuners, he had it standing up on its side uh, to save on space, and it accidentally got tipped over and fell flat. He turned it on to see if it still worked, and it not only did work, but the, <laughs> the digital lights had been, that had been out for years suddenly came back on. It's like a new tuner again. Well, uh, I guess that yeah, certainly can happen. Uh, something happens in the connectivity over the years, and uh, it stops working in a, uh, you know, a jolt. Um, maybe you know, got that connection going again. Um, 
uh, interesting. Wouldn't send my unit to a repair shop called Slams or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, it certainly can happen. I had a, a, in, in college some, um, I was in a, in a fraternity and uh, on many of those days there were some parties going on. And this was the middle of the day and some friends had uh, um, some, some liquid drinks and things. And uh, just so happened as the music was playing, someone managed to spill that into the receiver. And uh, so it, zzz, and it zipped out and that was the end of that party as far as the music was concerned. Um, so months went by and uh, no one, no one touched, the, the, touched the receiver whatsoever. And in the middle of the day, suddenly it went right back up to where it was uh, after many, many months. So, um, you know, kind of surprising, but, you know, th th this stuff is pretty robust and it takes a lot of, of abuse. I've got some, uh, another video where I've shown some restoration of some units that had no right to come back on. Uh, in fact, I do have a, some, of that, some of those kind of units in the back, and uh, at some point in the future, I will uh, do a video of, of those restorations um, and you know document those. But there's a good one on a Sansui uh, 3030 that um, was very much abused and, and still came back tick, uh, kicking. So, you know, they're pretty resilient. Okay, let's move on a little bit here. Uh, Paul Crowder says, have you ever thought about the possibility that vintage gear seems higher quality because all the defective units were thrown out years ago, leaving only the good ones for us to enjoy, while we're in the time where modern gear is just starting to fail? And similarly, uh, Dan Edwards says, have you taken into account survivor bias? That is, equipment made in the 50s and 60s that themselves became doorstops are not available to you now, since they've long been jumped. So in short, yes, I have thought about that uh, survivor bias uh, issue, and um, I just uh, do not agree with it and because I lived partially through that, at least the 70s era uh, of gear, and actually in the 70s, um, the, seeing the repercussions of uh, consumer taste changing and technology advancement. So back in the 64 and prior when tube gear as soon as solid state gear came out many people thought tube gear was extremely obsolete uh and, and my family which is very extensive uh, i have a very large family i can recall almost all of my relatives being very quick to replace those tvs and anything that had tubes in it because it was considered obsolete after that the same thing happened to the 70s gear uh, the advent of two things. One, the digital interface and push buttons for tuning in your station and the remote control. Those two things obsoleted the earlier gear very quickly. I can recall in the late 80s, early 90s, every, I, used to, I used to frequent pawn shops a lot. I was uh, always you know, going through them. I can recall seeing huge Pioneer receivers, Technics receivers, all of them lined up on shelves in pawn shops uh, just in mass. And, uh, I can recall at the time I too thought, uh, those were obsolete old things, uh, too large and too bulky. Um, too bad. I didn't uh, realize I was eventually going to start collecting them. But the point is that, no, I don't believe that everything was thrown out. I have so many stories of wives who know, who wanted smaller systems in their living rooms to hide that bow system in a, in a, in a little cabinet and not see the stereo at all didn't want to have that big thing, you know, up on a table any longer. And I know lots of people who found units in dumpsters, pulled them out, and they were absolutely fine. So I don't believe most gear was dumped because it stopped working. I think it was dumped because it, from the consumer perspective, it became obsolete. Uh, so so that's, that's my perspective on it. I, I mean, I'm not... Um, thinking that I'm only person that can be right, but that's my perspective. I really do think that the majority of units in mass were much better built and could have survived had it not been for uh, consumer taste change. So, okay, moving on to Douglas Blake. Uh, Douglas is a, uh, appears to be a former technician and um, hits it right on, on nail on the head from the very first comment here. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's been my philosophy my entire life for just about everything. I have uh, far too many things I've not let go of because they simply still work. And um, 
Uh, Douglas says, uh, before retiring, I would tell my customers that I do not do recaps because very often there is nothing to be gained by it. Well, I, it's pretty much my mantra. Um, so Doug says he would replace only the ones that were leaking or measured as deteriorated. Makes a lot more sense to have the thing serviced every 10 years for one or two parts than to massively tear the thing down, changing everything in sight simply because of its age completely ignoring the risk of technician error and mismarked boards. That kind of bowling ball service is massively disruptive to a working device. And yes, in audio devices, it will change the thing's sound. So one point I wanted to, to point out here, uh, this philosophy is um, in, in other industries. In the IT industry, uh, when you have change management, it's very common that you do not go and do many, many different changes at one time, because if something were to happen, you have a, a much higher challenge in trying to figure out what went wrong. So it's a, a much more simplified process, more controlled, only change what's necessary, and then do that over time. I think that's the same and very applicable to audio devices. Now, unless, of course, it's a, it's a smaller unit like a monoblock where there are very limited number of caps, um, if you're gonna go do that, you know, you may want to go ahead if you're talking only about a handful of caps versus a receiver that has possibly hundreds. Uh, so I think it's a bit of a, a discussion uh, point, a, a thought process you have to go through on what makes sense for that particular unit. But in general, I, I think Doug speaks from years of experience. I think it's hard to argue uh, with, with his perspective. Um, he goes on to say that uh, a second issue is that modern equipment is not made with technicians and repair in mind. In short, the new stuff is designed for the dump and not for service and maintenance. Not so sure about made for the dump specifically, uh, but I do think that uh, the design uh, methodology has changed a lot. Predominantly uh, using um, components that are, are um, made for single purpose manufacturing, uh, ICs and things like that. They only make a small batch of them. Once those parts are gone, you don't have any replacement parts to put them in there. So there is only a limited lifespan of those units. Uh, I, I have some and I'll do some uh, discussion on them later, but of the late 90s, uh, there are just unobtainium parts now and uh, you just can't keep the units. Although they're ex they were very expensive in their time, uh, you can't get them fixed uh, be simply because those parts are not available. Um, planned obsolescence, uh, you know, I do think that uh, there are some, um, some things that support this. Again, it, it's not as, as purposely planned. However, I do think that there are certainly uh, design corners that are cut that shorten the lifespan of, of a lot of modern gear. Um, one-upmanship happens so quickly, especially around, let's look at surround sound. Uh, the next format came, came, you know, very quickly in the next technology that even, you know, surround sound systems were being obsoleted within a year uh, before the next thing, you know, happened. It certainly happened in the era uh, of stereo, but it did seem to be a bit more gradual. The advent of stereo, for one thing, obsoleted mono. So there were one-upmanships there that did happen. It just happened uh, at, a, at a bit of a slower pace. Okay, gonna move on. Lastly, Max Bishop. Max says that the one, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I appreciate the visual style of your videos. By that I mean the clean look of your equipment and the fact that I do not see wires and cables going everywhere. Uh, first off, thank you very much. Uh, I certainly try. It, uh, I'm still new at this, still learning. Um, I'm using a, basically a shoestring budget here to do my videos, but uh, trying to make them as visually appealing uh, is a goal. And uh, thank you for noticing. I will uh, continue to do that. I do uh, have some things that I still try to improve upon. Uh, not perfect by any means, but um, thank you for noticing and uh, commenting on it. So. That's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, those were the summaries of um, some of the themes that I picked up on the comments. Uh, keep adding to them. And um, if there's enough comments here for this one, I'll also do a summary of this if there's any you know, specific questions. Um, 
There are some questions about some of the, the, uh, the modern units that I, I selected as examples. I don't plan on you know, continuing to uh, um, knock them uh, specifically. Uh, they are again just examples uh, to, to discuss a, an overall theme. So uh, for those, if you want to send me an email directly, that's fine. And as always, thank you guys for tuning in. If you don't want to miss the next video, hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time.